You can now order a disturbing plush and the link is in the description and pinned in the comments. During the 20th century, a medical procedure was developed to deal with a host of medical conditions. It was billed as a cure for postnatal depression, schizophrenia, anxiety, and a host of other conditions. The transorbital lobotomy was developed from existing surgery techniques to be capable of being carried out anywhere and by any medical practitioner, sold as a quick solution to growing mental health problems. All that was required was an ice pick to be hammered through a person's eye, into the brain and then used to sever the brain fibers connecting different parts of the brain. Lobotomies carried great risks, with around 15% dying from the practice, with many more left a shell of their former selves. In today's video, we will cover the development of the lobotomy, details how the practice grew and the horrors inflicted on so many. The transorbital lobotomy was developed by American neurologist Walter Freeman. Whilst he developed the procedure, it took inspiration and shared techniques of similar surgeries. The procedure devised by Freeman involved an ice pick, or later a specialized tool called an orbitoclast being placed alongside the bridge of a patient's nose. The pick is then hammered into the skull, guided by the bridge of the nose, then penetrating through the thin layer of bone in the eye socket. It would be hammered 5 cm deep, where it was then pivoted 40 degrees. The pick would then be hammered a further 2 cm before another pivot of 28 degrees. The pick would be removed and the procedure would be repeated, this time through the other eye. The origins of the transorbital lobotomy can be traced to earlier treatments as far back as the 1880s. There were a number of surgeries carried out by Gottlieb Burkhardt where sections of the frontal, temporal, and temporoparietal lobes were cut out in the hopes of curing mania, dementia, and psychosis. The field of psychosurgery was seen as a solution to curing many of the patients who occupied the asylums and psychiatric hospitals. It was soon expanded upon by Portuguese neurologist Antonio Iga Monis. Monis believed that mental illness was caused by irregular neural connections in the frontal lobe. In particular, Monis noted that veterans of the First World War who had suffered brain injuries to this region often displayed a subdued or altered character. Working alongside neurosurgeon Almeida Lima, he developed the procedure known as a leucotomy, the precursor to the transorbital lobotomy. Monis's surgery would involve a person being anaesthetized. Holes would then be drilled into a person's skull before ethyl alcohol would be injected into the prefrontal cortex, destroying their fibrous connections. Alcohol, however, was seen to have damaged other parts of the brain and was soon replaced with a tool called a leucotome. A leucotome was a needle-like device with a retractable wire loop. Once it was inserted into a patient's brain, it would be rotated, severing the brain fibers. Of the 38 initial test subjects, 10 were deemed to have been cured, 9 were seen to have improved whilst the rest saw no improvement. Monis declared his new procedure a resounding success, stating that in the most extreme of cases, it would offer some level of respite, and insisted it was a simple and safe operation. Whilst the leucotomy did catch on in Europe in the late 1930s, it was not a particularly common procedure. The procedure, however, did catch the attention of an American doctor named Walter Freeman. Freeman had met Moniz at a conference and was immediately drawn to the procedure. Freeman was a physician from a prodigious family. Both his father and grandfather were successful doctors. His grandfather in particular, William Williams Keane, being the first American brain surgeon. Moniz became a sort of mentor for Freeman, who eagerly altered the leucotomy into the lobotomy. Instead of severing some of the connections from the frontal lobes, Freeman's procedure severed the connections between the frontal lobes and the thalamus. Freeman was not a trained surgeon, and so he recruited neurosurgeon James Watts to carry out the Watts-Freeman procedure. By 1942, the team had performed over 200 lobotomies, with results published that two-thirds of their patients had some improvement. 
One of their patients who did not improve and in fact deteriorated was Rosemary Kennedy, sister to future president John F. Kennedy. Rosemary's father had her lobotomized for seizures and behaviors that were deemed embarrassing and could hinder Kennedy's political ambitions for his children. It soon became clear that the lobotomy had been a massive failure. Rosemary's mental capacity shrank to that of a two-year-old child. She was unable to talk, walk, or control her bodily functions. Rosemary and her condition was swept under the rug, hidden from public in an institution, hidden away from her family by her father. Rosemary was not alone in experiencing such side effects, with many left in what was often termed as medically induced childhood. As the lobotomy was a surgery, it had its limitations. It required a surgical room with anesthesia and a trained surgeon. Freeman took inspiration from an Italian surgeon named Omaro Fiamberti. In 1937, Fiamberti developed the transorbital lobotomy, where the frontal lobes were accessed via the eye sockets. Fiamberti's procedure was to puncture the thin orbital bone at the top of the eye socket, and then inject alcohol into the frontal lobes, though would sometimes use a leucotome. This method was far less invasive and did not require the level of surgery as the standard lobotomy. Freeman altered the procedure even further, using a long ice pick as the tool to sever the brain fibers. Freeman was eager for his new procedure to become the norm. Whereas previous lobotomies were recommended for only the most severe cases, or where there was little hope of recovery, Freeman suggested his transorbital lobotomy could cure most mental illnesses, from anxiety, ADD, obsessive compulsive disorder, or postnatal depression. What's more, it could be performed anywhere and by anyone. Anesthesia and sterile surgeries were no longer required for a lobotomy. Freeman would train neurologists in how to conduct his procedure, and it would be possible to carry out in any doctor's office. Rather than rely on anesthetic, Freeman recommended that the patient be rendered unconscious by means of electroshock. Freeman was ever the showman as a means of advertising and promoting his transorbital lobotomy. He would offer shows to the public where they could watch him perform the procedure, often with a dramatic flair. For example, he would often perform two lobotomies at once. In one infamous instance, Freeman posed for a photograph whilst he was carrying out a lobotomy. As he turned to face the camera, he moved the ice pick lodged in the patient's skull, causing a fatal brain hemorrhage. Watson Freeman would part ways as a result of Freeman's methods. Watts was concerned about the lack of surgical expertise required for the transorbital lobotomy, and as Freeman had excluded Watts from his research in coming up with the new process, Freeman would branch out on his own, traveling to the various mental institutions across the United States. He would preach his views on the efficacy of the transorbital lobotomy and gaining notoriety. Whilst many protested the widespread use of the practice, Plenty of others took up Freeman's procedure and carried it out on a huge scale. Freeman would only charge $25 for a lobotomy, and is believed to have personally carried out some 3,439 procedures over his career, the majority using an ice pick. Despite Freeman's marketing, the transorbital lobotomy was not the magic cure-all as it was sold. Around 15% of all patients died as a result of the procedure. Many more relapsed shortly after the operation, the very conditions that they were thought to be cured of often coming back stronger than ever. Many more were left a shell of their former selves. It was not uncommon for a lobotomy patient to exhibit changes in their personality, motor, or bodily functions in speech. Risk of infection was high, with Freeman often ignoring proper hygiene during his procedures. Freeman was also more than prepared to lobotomize children, the youngest being only four years old. In all, some 40,000 lobotomies were performed in the United States alone. Whilst Freeman sought to push his procedure, there were plenty in the field of medicine that saw the transorbital lobotomy as an abomination. Plenty of publications, such as the Journal of the American Medical Association, were not satisfied with the evidence of the successes of lobotomies. 
Many saw the lobotomy as a method to free up bed space in hospitals, as a quick fix to criminal behaviour, or as a way to rid oneself of a problematic family member. By the 1950s, the development and availability of chemical medications rendered the transorbital lobotomy obsolete. In 1953, the Soviet Union banned the procedure on the grounds it was contrary to the principles of humanity. Other countries soon followed suit, instead looking to the new antipsychotic and antidepressant medications that were far more effective. In addition, the practice of cognitive behavioural therapy was seen as a safer, more permanent solution to many a patient's condition. Nevertheless, Freeman continued to push his procedure until the 1960s. It was not until 1967 that Freeman performed his final surgery on a patient named Helen Mortensen. This was not Helen's first lobotomy, having had two already performed by Freeman, though it would be her last. She died of a cerebral hemorrhage, bringing the total who died at Freeman's hands to as many as 100. It was at this point that he was banned from performing the surgery he had built his whole career upon. Today, the lobotomy is no longer recognised as a viable treatment. Whilst the medical field of psychosurgery has declined in favour of cognitive and medical treatments, the use of lobotomies should have been seen as a non-starter. Yet, they were able to be performed for over three decades. Whilst it was part of the process in better understanding mental illness, it was not a viable method of treatment for many. Whilst early practitioners of the lobotomy emphasised the niche application of the procedure, the likes of Freeman sought to expand its use as much as possible. Whether this stemmed from a desire to help or some nefarious motivation is hard to say. Though, it should be noted how Freeman seemingly ignored developments in cognitive and medicinal treatments in favour of his barbaric practices. I would invite you to read and research more on the topic if it interests you. One place to start could be the book Messing With My Head, The Shocking True Story of My Lobotomy, written by Howard Dully. Dully was only 12 years old when he received his lobotomy from Freeman and his recovery is a remarkable story. We ought to remember the countless thousands who were damaged by arguably the biggest mistake in modern medicine.